we've completed three guides that address knowing what is on your network, knowing who is on your network, and knowing what's happening on your network. Welcome listeners to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm here as usual with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's going to introduce the subject and the guest of today's show. Andrew, how's it going? Thank you, Nate. We have two guests today. We have Jim McCarthy, the federal lead for the NIST National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, the NCCOE. And we have Don Fotz, who is the cybersecurity architect for energy sector projects at the NCCOE. And they're going to be talking to us about the Industrial Internet of Things for Distributed Energy Resources Cybersecurity. This is a a new project at the NCCOE. Industrial security people really aren't one for brief acronyms, are you? NCCOE, CS2AI. Yeah, it it uh, it gets bad, especially in the in the engineering field. And this is a government agency; they're they're known for their acronyms as well. So you put the two of us together, and it uh, it gets grim. Fair enough. Let's listen in. Thank you, uh, Don and Jim, for joining us. Um, can we start at the big at the beginning? Not 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 all of our you know I think most of our listeners have have heard of NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, but not everyone's heard of the NCCOE. Uh, can you say a few words about about who is the NCCOE and what is your mandate, please? All right. So uh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, again, thanks for having uh, Don and I on your call today. So as far as the NCCOE, it's definitely part of NIST, and NIST is part of the Department U.S. Department of Commerce. And the NCCOE was stood up about uh, six or seven years ago uh, to address the cybersecurity concerns coming from industry. Um, our mandate is basically to provide cybersecurity guidance, in, in my case, in, for the energy sector, uh, directly to industry. In a moment, we're going to talk about the Industrial Internet of Things, but I know before we get there, you folks have done a lot of different projects. Can you give us an idea of, of what you've got under your belt already? Our projects to date in the energy sector have focused on the fundamentals of cybersecurity for operational technology networks at utilities and energy companies. We've completed three guides that address knowing what is on your network, knowing who is on your network, and knowing what's happening on your network. From the who is, from the what is on your network perspective, we have a guide that addresses energy sector asset management. And it demonstrates a solution to help ensure you know about all of the devices that are operating on your operational technology network and what their configuration is. This guide complements an earlier guide that we prepared for the financial sector that addresses asset management for IT networks. So together, these provide a comprehensive asset management solution for both IT and OT networks. Our second guide addresses identity and access management. It provides a converged solution to let you manage who is allowed on both your IT and OT networks and what they are allowed to do on those networks. And the third guide, situational awareness, demonstrates how you can monitor the OT network, how you can capture network traffic, capture log files from various applications on that network, and also monitor the actual process information, bring all of that together in a security information and event management system where it could be combined with OT, I mean, sorry, could be combined with information technology monitoring and with physical security monitoring to give you a complete situational awareness for your enterprise. So for those out there who are interested in any one of the number of topics that they just covered there, um, Andrew, it sounds like these are subjects that we've covered before on the show with different guests, right? We've covered asset management. We've covered, um, you know, who gets access to your systems. We have, um, you know, scratching my head over recent episodes, um, asset management we covered, I think, first with uh, Verve. 
because they have technology in that space. Um, a lot of the uh, the intrusion detection vendors have that technology or have you know something like that technology as well. Um, Skate Defense comes to mind most recently, a couple of episodes ago. Um, in between, you know, we had we had people talking about the importance of asset management. Uh, Matt Gibson from EPRI was was talking about you know one of the ways to to defeat your your opponents is to know your systems better than they do, and the first step of that is to figure out what you have. Um, identity and access management, you know, this is a very common function in industrial control systems. Um, you know, figuring out who has permission to do what. The only episode I remember recently talking about this was uh, Zage talking about their blockchain implementation of an, an access management solution. But I, I might be mistaken. There might have been other episodes. We've, we're in, like, this is what, episode 37 or so that we're, we're coming up on. So, uh, And situational awareness is basically security monitoring. It's knowing what's going on. Am I under attack? Who's on my system? What, you know, asset management is part of situational awareness. It, it's an input into situational awareness. Um, and we've had lots of people talking about intrusion detection. We've had, uh, you know, people talking about the, the monitoring function. And in fact, that very project, the, the NCCOE situational awareness project, Waterfall was part of. We were one of the contributors to that project. And I'll be giving some examples from that project to, to illustrate some of the, uh, you know, Jim and Don's comments as we go along. You've got three projects under your belt. You're undertaking a fourth with the industrial internet. Um, you know, can you can you give us sort of the next level of detail? How do you decide to uh, to work on these projects? Where did these come from? Uh, good question, Andrew. Uh, basically, the, the business model that's set up at the NCCOE is for us. That is NIST NCCOE. Reach directly out to industry, engage with them, ask them what their most compelling cybersecurity challenges are. Again, I mentioned that this is happening in many sectors at the NCCOE. I'm particularly um, focused on energy sectors. So, in uh, the inception of a project takes place when we basically go out, uh, contact. Um, this group of this community of interest that we've built over the course of time, ask them, what do you think we should be doing in terms of cybersecurity challenges, especially in the energy sector? They come back with the answers. Ultimately, we provide something called a draft project description where we take all the details, uh, get everything down on paper and provide that as a public draft and allow for a comment period. Once uh, we receive all the comments, we tend to know if we have a viable project or not, depending on the level of comments we get back. And then we go and uh, basically take all that feedback, adjudicate the comments, and provide something called a final pro project description. What takes place from that point is once, once we are, again, confident that we have a viable project, we'll go out and solicit collaboration through the federal register, which allows any company, um, as long as they have a commercially available product, to participate or collaborate with NIST NCCOE on the development of the solution or basically the solution to address the challenge that was highlighted in this project description. It's done on a first come first serve basis. Nobody pays us uh, to participate in our projects and we don't pay any collaborators. It's all done via collaborative research and development agreement, otherwise known as a CRADA. And that basically is the process for all of NCCOE's projects, especially the ones we've done in the energy sector. So this next project, the uh, Industrial Internet of Things, uh, Distributed Energy Resource Cybersecurity was done the exact same way. So, Nate, let me jump in and say a word about the Federal Register for anyone who's not familiar with it. Um, this is where government agencies formally, legally announce stuff. So, uh, you know, NIST is a government agency. The NCCOE is a government agency. When they announce a new project and they open the project to participation from, you know, from industry, um, that has to be a, a formal, transparent announcement. They can't call up their friends and say, hey, you know, are you interested? It goes out on the Federal Register. All of those sort of uh, announcements for transparency sake have to go out in the Federal Register. And, you know, I got involved with the Federal Register. Actually, I started tracking it. Um, you know, I, I set up alerts on the Federal Register uh, 
I don't know, about seven, eight years ago, when I started getting involved in keeping track of what's going on with NERC SIP, which is the electric sector uh, standards and regulations in North America, in the United States. On behalf of listeners who who think that what you just said sounds pretty useful and might want to set something like that up for themselves, Andrew, how did you go about doing it? If I recall correctly, what you do is you go to the Federal Register site, federalregister.gov, and you can browse, you know, things that you're interested in. If there's a department you wanna you wanna track, um, basically every every topic in the register, there tends to be a subscribe button on the right hand side. When you're looking at an edition of the Federal Register, it comes out daily, I think, every weekday. Um, you can subscribe to the department. You can subscribe to that kind of announcement. That's not really what I did, though. What I did was I went to the search bar and enter search keywords that you're interested in. I was interested in NERC SIP. I was interested in the NCCOE. I was interested in cybersecurity. You can search the Federal Register for those keywords, and when the results come up, every one of the, 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 the search criteria has a subscribe button beside it. You press subscribe. You have to be logged in. You have to have, you know, you create yourself a free account. You press subscribe. And now you start getting emailed notifications of any new document that matches the search criteria that you're using. And I found this to be very useful. I, it, you know, I keep on top of stuff this way. A word from our sponsor. Waterfall Security Solutions is the OT security company. At Waterfall, we see a lot of industrial sites struggling with very sophisticated ransomware attacks. These attacks use powerful tools and techniques that only five years ago, only nation states were using. To defeat these attacks reliably, we need a practical and future-proof approach to security. The most widely used such approach is documented in a new book, Secure Operations Technology. The book documents the surprisingly simple security measures that are used by the world's most secure and most efficient industrial sites. As a public service, Waterfall Security Solutions is providing free copies of the SecOT book to security practitioners while supplies last. To request your free copy of the book, please visit waterfall-security.com and look for the book under the resources menu. We're coming into the the industrial Internet of Things, um, but sort of every application of the the Internet of Things technology is different. You're applying the technology to distributed energy uh, resources. Can you talk about you know what what is distributed energy to you? What what's the physical process look like here? And uh, if you can, you know what kind of automation tends to be in place for this this physical process that that you're you're uh, you're looking at. So, so distributed energy resources r- refer to things like solar and wind and battery storage systems that are starting to become popular uh, to provide power to utilities. The difference and the reason they're called distributed is that traditionally electricity was generated by large generators transmitted over transmission lines to local utilities who then distributed it so the power flow is generally one way from from generation to transmission to distribution with distributed energy resources the actual creation of power by solar cells or windmills or from batteries occurs at the distribution level so that power flow in the distribution system is now two way um, from consumer from the dis- from the utility to the consumers and also from uh, distributed energy resource operators back into that grid or from customers like homes with solar energy so so that's what the distributed energy resources are all about from an automation perspective uh, it's necessary for the distribution utility to be able to exercise some level of control over whether these distributed resources are providing energy out into the distribution grid or not, and it needs to be done in, in near real time. So this is a level of automation that has not traditionally been seen. For example, uh, things like cogeneration plants 
on industrial campuses are common, and they also had the capability to provide power uh, back into the distribution grid. But traditionally, that control was exercised by a telephone call from the utility uh, to the cogeneration plant operator. And, and while you could still do that with solar, you lose a lot of, and uh, wind, you lose a lot of the efficiency. So the goal is to get to the point where a utility can, um, in some ways, control whether or not power generation from these distributed energy resources is providing energy to the grid or not without interacting with humans so that it can be done efficiently. So for this project, we're focusing on distributed energy resources at a utility or commercial scale. So a large solar farm that might be installed on a university campus or an industrial campus or a large solar array that might be installed and and operated by a utility. We are not going to look at home solar energy systems. Uh, While they are similar, uh, there are There are way too many of them, and those systems tend to be self-contained. And so the ability to insert cybersecurity capabilities that weren't built in is limited. Uh, There is a potential way that our solution could be used for those in in that uh, there are middlemen or aggregators who typically sit between the utility and the home solar arrays and aggregate them in a way that they look like a large uh, DER installation to the utility. So the capabilities where you hope to develop would be useful to those aggregators. We're coming into the the IIoT part of the the, the project here. Um, You know, IIoT uh, means different things to different people. What does it mean to you folks for for the purpose of this project? Good point, Andrew. I, th- I think one of the things that we, when we solicited uh, collaboration for this project or, or we're testing, testing the water, so to speak, is a lot of folks seem to uh, want to address some concerns about IOT, I, IOT slash IIoT or particularly the industrial internet of things. The fact that we're using distributed energy resources does not necessarily make this an IOT project. The way we see it is basically, um, independently connected devices to uh, to the grid. The fact that this is IoT really hinges upon um, the use of the internet now as as the communications network uh, in large part. That's what's enabling a lot of these DERs to be stood up out there. So you have communication traversing and basically um, uh, uh, a universal connection point known as known as the internet, which is enabling all this to take place without having to install private communications between uh, DER sites and and um, uh, basically the industrial the industrial microgrid and the utility per se. So, given that context, we thought this would be a good idea. Not that NIST itself seeks to define industrial internet of things, but we thought that the enabling technology, the internet per se, um, probably uh, made this lean more towards being an IIoT type implementation, specifically within the context of distributed energy resources at the level that Don just spoke about, not necessarily the home, but uh, the industrial uh, industrial level microgrids, uh, so to speak, and, and sites just like them or, or similar to them. Uh, that makes sense to me. I mean, if you're communicating control system information across the internet, that's the industrial internet. That's <laughs> that's what it means. Yes, it's not exclusively limited to that, though. Uh, just so you know, we did bring in a a private comms provider because we believe that there's uh, very much a need for for that type of capability uh, on these campuses within the campus itself. But if you think of how uh, this is being enabled, we think primarily uh, the internet has a lot to do with it. So if we're starting to talk here about the internet, you know, sort of worming its way into the power grid, um, Andrew, you know, I'm not an industrial security expert here, but I get the sense that that's not a great thing. Well, security wise, you know, it is definitely a concern. And, you know, that's why this project is going on. So, you know, talking about using the internet deep into the power grid, um, 
is a question I actually asked uh, Jim and Don uh, uh, a little bit later on. So uh, let's let's leave sort of the the topic of the wisdom of the internet um, a little bit later. Um, but what I wanted to to talk about was, um, you know, Jim and Don they mentioned um, private communications providers a, a, as part of the project, as well as you know internet communications. Um, I wanted to mention that historically and still today in in sort of the big iron power grid um just about nothing goes across the internet i mean in power distribution utilities where you're communicating with consumers and they want to know you know what's this number on my bill you've got an uh, an internet website you communicate with consumers across the internet um and you know if you have a little solar array for you know one or two kilowatts on your on your roof Really, the only practical way to to talk to that tiny level of power production is across the the internet. That's how you talk to consumers. Um, but uh, you know the the focus of this project is sort of intermediate size installations, not the consumers, but what they called microgrids. So you might have a an industrial site, uh, a refinery, or uh, uh, a water treatment plant. I mean, water treatment plants produce methane as stuff in the water decomposes. Uh, the methane can be burned to produce power. This is a thing at, at water treatment plants. Now the water treatment plant is a consumer of energy because the pumps need electricity. It's also a producer of electricity. To an extent, the, the, the plant you know might be able to pr- provide its own power for some of the day, but need integration with the grid the rest of the time. This is what's called a microgrid, where you have a, a site, it might be a university campus, it might be a water treatment plant, it might be something else, it might be a refinery, that's producing a certain amount of power and consuming a certain amount of power and is to a degree independent of the grid, hence the term microgrid, but is still integrated with the grid. When you've got a significant sized facility like that, um, in you know nowadays you might still say that's big enough to lease a line. I don't want the internet in the picture, uh, but I need to, to you know connect to the that that microgrid. Or it, you might say that's too small. It's not worth a leased line. These things cost money, uh, and you you talk to these th- these systems across the internet. So that's the sort of the lowest level of granularity in terms of the back end generation, sort of big iron. You know, this is the the beginning of the internet in the power grid. This is we're we're starting to get small enough that the internet is a is a player as opposed to like i said the bigger installations in the power grid where everything is leased so we're talking here about uh campus sized solar installations communicating with a power utility over the internet um what are your goals for the project what are you hoping to to demonstrate what are you hoping to to uh show people how to do one of the key concerns that was brought to us is the data integrity component, right? This is basically hinging upon the integrity of the data that's going back and forth between um, the campus and or the uh, the utility itself. There's two concerns. It's, it's the integrity of the data, safeguarding against attacks in that communication stream, and then the propagation of malware um, within that stream as well. And we're not just talking about the data about the, the power exchange, we're talking about the command and control data as well. So the objectives here are to show people or to demonstrate the technology, security technologies in particular that can be applied to safeguard against attacks that could um, manipulate or change the data in any way or propagate malware uh, between endpoints. In this case, the endpoints are considered the, let's say the microgrid and the utility um, or any other independent uh, DER provider that's out there connected in some way uh, to a utility. So the other aspect of, of this problem is that I- instead of you know tightly coupled small number of organizations, we, we now have a utility and perhaps a very large number of distributed energy resource operators. So in addition to providing communications integrity and detecting malware, we have to worry about knowing who did what when. So the idea here is that we need an immutable audit trail. 
so that if something goes wrong, there's a way to trace back and determine what happened. And while the utility may have an audit trail of what it asked the DER operators to do, and each operator may have an audit trail of what they actually did, um, if after an incident you had to bring all of those things together in one place, it would be potentially time consuming, it would be potentially difficult to align things in time. And so we're hoping to demonstrate something we call a command register that maintains a distributed immutable record of the information exchanges between the utility and the DER operator so that should something go wrong, uh, we can actually determine what went wrong and, and where it went wrong and rectify for the future. The other aspect of having multiple organizations involved is having situational awareness over the state of the entire system, the utility and all of the DER operators. So we are using uh, cloud-based data collection and analysis providers to collect up monitoring information from all of the DER operators as well as the utility, and hopefully be able to provide both uh, situational awareness to each of the individual operators and the utility, as well as an aggregate picture uh, of the entire operation so that everyone is aware of what's happening from a cybersecurity perspective. So an immutable audit trail, that's I thought one of the characteristics of blockchain. Are we are we drifting into blockchain territory here? Yes, actually, we are. Two of our collaborators uh, in this project, who we are looking to to help us build this command register, do use blockchain technology in their products, and and so that is potentially part of our solution space. Although it will not be directly visible, it will be incorporated in the products that we use. And let me add to that, Andrew, by saying that we did not solicit particularly for a blockchain capability. We solicited for people to be able to provide us with the, a command register setup, whatever enabling technology they wanted to use. So as Don mentioned, the fact that it's blockchain um, will be highlighted, but it's kind of incidental to the fact that we're what we're trying to do is set up this immutable record. And please understand one thing. There's also going to have to be uh, a very highly manual component, we believe, where all parties concerned, whether it involves third-party aggregators, uh, the DER operator, and the utility, they all have to agree on what they would deem an immutable record. Without that, uh, basically the technology, although it works, wouldn't work in a situation unless all parties agree to it. So the trust aspect is is a is a big thing here, and it needs to be emphasized that the this immutable record is only is only going to be as good as the parties agreeing to use it. Because we we also have the understanding that there's many different types of technologies out there. How would we uh, bring to bear uh, uh, this command register that uh, would be amiable for all parties to agree to be used? That's that was. We believe that's going to be one of the challenges, but not necessarily one that we can solve. We can present the technology and and highlight an explanation as to how it it should be viewed overall. Andrew, a month or two back when we spoke with Roman Aryutinov about uh, blockchain and industrial security, um, you and I were speaking about it like it was this sort of new and niche thing. Um, but here we have Don and Jim talking about how they're implementing it in NCCOE. That's right. And, you know, in a sense, it's, uh, it's not surprising. Um, a little later on, I asked them for a list of... Uh, the participants in the project because it's a public project. Zage is one of the participants. So everything that Roman told us applies here. This is, you know, this is, uh, it's the it's the same organization. It's the same technology. I, I'm wondering who's the chicken and who's the egg here. Is it that the folks at the NCCOE and elsewhere were looking for a new sort of maybe blockchain-esque solution um, and then Roman and Zage and others came up with it? 
Or is it that by virtue of Roman and Zage um, existing and blockchain being introduced to the industrial sector, folks at the NCCOE saw that and are now starting to pick up on it? I think it's closer to the latter. So the process of defining uh, one of these NCCOE projects is very public. It's very transparent. So, you know, as as Jim mentioned very early on, um, one of the things they, they do is they put out, well, first off, they get, they get a request from industry saying, we have a problem here. We'd like you to demonstrate a solution. And the problem had to do with distributed energy resources. And so they put out a, you know, they do some homework and say, well, how are people solving this problem? Because one of the criteria for participating in a project like this, one of their strict criteria is you cannot invent a solution for the project. They only allow participants who have commercially available, you know, uh, reasonably widely deployed technology products um, that are applied to the problem already. That's the only kind of participant they want. And so when they get a question like this, they start going out asking the question, how are people solving this? What kind of solutions are available? They, they, you know, they put out a draft architecture saying, you know, it sounds like one of each of these sounds like it would solve the problem. They don't name names at that point. It's technologies. And then, you know, they get feedback on that from industry. And then they put out the call saying, okay, we need this kind of stuff. Who wants to participate? And now people like Zage and other, you know, Waterfall in the past can step up and say, we would like to contribute to the project. And so it's not that, uh, you know, they said, hey, let's do a blockchain thing. It's that they said, uh, you know, what are people doing? How are they solving this? And because... Zage and others have commercially available products that are solving this problem, that are based on the blockchain. It's that's why, in my understanding, you 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 get connected like this. It's because uh, people are doing this already, and here's an example of what people are doing. So you've got the the DER IIoT project. Um, it's underway, I understand. How's it going? How you know what? How far along are you folks? We are in the process of constructing the build architecture at this time. Uh, we're somewhat constrained uh, with with uh, basically we're in in a time where um, we have limited access to the facilities that we had planned on using, um, such as a university campus and whatnot. So we're in the process of developing a small proof of concept that is limited to our lab at NCCOE. And once we uh, we're starting to install vendor products and and testing out or doing research research on the components that we actually want want to construct or the outcomes that uh, that we're trying to achieve in a very limited manner at this point. But when, and that should be soon, infrastructure that we have targeted for use and this becomes available, then we can proceed with the full-blown project. All the collaborators have been selected. We have all the technologies that we need secured it in place. Um, everyone on the project so far has uh, an in-depth understanding of the goals and, and the desired outcomes. And we've also started, as I mentioned, this uh, proof of concept um, limited to a lab build right now. But in order to provide uh, more credibility and viability for the sake of industry, most of the projects we conduct, at least uh, energy sector projects, we try to extend ourselves out to real infrastructure. And that's been the case with all of the previous projects that we mentioned earlier, Andrew, and, and especially the case in this one. Yeah, so so what we've actually set up in the lab is an emulation in inside of VMware of a utility wide area network and a microgrid operator network and we are constructing the interface between those two things. The idea here is to learn how to use all of the cybersecurity products that we have available, learn how to integrate them with the goal of getting access to some actual physical infrastructure and then migrating what we've built in the lab out to an actual solar or other distributed energy resource installation uh, and and being able to use the piece parts that we've we've built ahead of time uh, to do that deployment, thereby 
taking advantage of the resources we have and moving as far down the path as we can go uh, until we actually are back in physical facilities again. So what went unsaid in that answer? I mean, this this uh, this recording with Jim and Don was uh, sort of the middle of May. What was unsaid in the answer was COVID. Um, normally what these folks do, you know, if you want to participate in one of these projects, the participants donate hardware and software products to the cause for a period of, I don't know how many years, because it's for the duration of the project. And then the demo setup is left set up semi-permanently at the NCCOE headquarters for people to, you know, in, p- people in industry to come in and have a look at. Um, and so they actually want to set up the complete solution. But to do that, they've actually got to physically travel to the the site that has uh, in the, that's that's that is the distributed energy resource that is that they're connecting to. And they've got to install equipment at the site. They've got to actually do the project. And none of that can happen in the world of COVID. So what they've done is they've got you know one of each piece of hardware and software. They've got it all connected in a virtual environment and they're doing all this virtual stuff at the NCCOE office because they can't do the real thing. They can't travel to site right now. You know, a demonstration project for the government does not constitute critical infrastructure, even though what they're touching might be considered critical infrastructure. So they're they're uh, hoping that the travel restrictions lift and they can start deploying some of this real stuff that's been depl- that's been uh, contributed and that they've figured out how to connect up. They have all the the uh, the details worked out in the lab and they can get it deployed and uh, sort of finish the job. And so you've assembled a a team of of contributors who are going to be working with you on you know setting up all these VMs and and making all this happen. Um, are you allowed to mention who these folks are? Certainly, Andrew. We're bringing a lot of capability to this particular build, and and I'd be glad to mention the names. And these are all published on the uh, NIST NCCOE website under this particular project. Uh, Antarix, which is a communications provider, we have Black Ridge Technology, Cisco. Um, Dots and Bridges, a company by the name of Rataflow, Spherical Analytics, Sumo Logic, TDI Technology, and Zage Security, all of whom bring the the technologies that we solicited or the security capabilities that we solicited directly in that project description. This is pretty much the the field that we're playing with right now, and we are we strongly believe that the combination of this. A great group of companies and tech providers uh, can get us to where we need to be in terms of the final outcome that we're searching, seeking, excuse me. And this final outcome, I mean, uh, you know, the NCCOE, the the N is NIST. Uh, you're, you know, you're, you're part of or affiliated with NIST. NIST produces a lot of standards. Is this work going to result in a standard for distributed energy resources? Not a standard per se. What we do do is we apply certain standards to it, not just NIST standards, um, but if you think of IEC, IEEE, uh, ISA, things like that, any standard that pertains to, to what we're trying to accomplish here is fair game. The outcome here or the goal here is not to produce a standard. It's to use uh, existing standards to provide a solution to a challenge as we mentioned before, that was brought to us by industry. And it's true that NIST develops standards, and there's no shortage of standards in in the energy space. The interesting thing about standards, however, is they tell you what to do, but not necessarily how to do it. And there's often a gap between what you need to do and, and how you should go about it. And that's the gap that we try to fill is that you know we, we look at a cybersecurity challenge, we look at the relevant standards, and then we work with our vendor partners to figure out how to do what the standard asks us to do. Andrew, we're quite a bit into the interview now, and you guys have been referencing a lot uh, what the NCCOE has been producing, but I still don't know what exactly that is. So that's a good question. Um, for each of these projects, they produce uh, uh, three documents. Um, you add up all the pages, you know, each of these projects produces something like 400 to 500 pages of result. Uh, the first document uh, is, you know, 
I think, fairly small. It's talking about the scope and exec summary. Um, the next one's a little more detailed about uh, the solution, how it's all connected, what the pieces do. Um, but the big piece is, you know, do they call it part C, A, B, C. Um, the big piece is a how-to. And so he talked about, you know, we're not inventing a new standard here. We're telling you how to use the standard. They do a how-to in enormous detail. So they've got, you know, what, nine participants here. Uh, you know, that was about that many commercial vendors involved in the project that I was involved with a couple of years ago, the situational awareness. And, you know, volume three, part C of the document said, okay, you've seen you know, the high level of how these systems are connected together. Let's get into the nitty gritty. Bring up this system. You install it on this kind of machine and the install, you know, the first the first screen on the install diagram looks like this. Click that button. Next screen looks like that. Click that button. Now it's all installed. Bring up the configuration tool. We need to create one of these. So click this button. This is the screen that comes up. It's a blow by blow. If you want to reproduce exactly what we've done in our lab so that you can use this on your system, buy one of each of these, click these buttons, see you can produce exactly the same thing we have and it will work for you because we've proven in the lab that it works. So when they talk about a how-to, it's very detailed. So you know when they're done, nobody in industry can say anymore, I don't know how to do this. They've shown how to do this. That's that's what they're producing, and you know these these documents are are available for anybody who needs to use them. Is it helpful at a certain point when your manual is five hundred pages long? I know that that I did not read the entire document myself, but um, I think the point is that you 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 may not you may not need to read the entire document. Um, you know these are standard products that are used in industry, and so. If you're scratching your head how to do something and you pull up one of these documents, you might go, I already know how to use this product and that product. My question was this part of it. Let me see how this one does it. And so you go to the pieces that you don't know and and you fill it in. And, you know, if you don't know anything, well, then having 500 pages to read is better than not having anything is is my guess. My thoughts go out to their in-house writers. Yeah, these are two-year projects. This is part of why. It's, uh, it is a lot of work to get it all documented. So what we're talking about is, you know, the industrial internet of things. You're talking about the internet being part of, in a sense, the, the control system for the power grid. Um, you know, is, is that wise? Is, are there not risks there? There are risks, Andrew, and, and we're not encouraging anybody to basically uh, connect their whole infrastructure to the internet. That's not the case at all. But in the case of an application such as what we have here, for lack of a uh, private communications network, we believe that uh, you know the ability to, to stand up all these DERs or independently owned and operate a DERs and connect to the utility is being enabled by the internet. We're not encouraging anybody to hang all their devices without any protection off the internet at all. That's that's not the case. In fact, you know we're we're a big uh, proponent of secure communications, no matter what communications medium is being used. It's just in this case, it's already happening. It's out there. People are using the internet for this type of connectivity, and our objective is to help them find a way to secure that, most especially the communications and obviously the command and control. So this has been good. Um, was there? A parting thought you wanted to leave with our listeners. Sure, Andrew. Uh, I'm going to let Don give his own parting thought, but I'll say one thing. You know, in terms of uh, at least being from the federal lead standpoint, we're encouraging as many people as we can all the time uh, to engage uh, with the NIST NCCOE, and that's because we believe you know the more ideas and the more input we have, the better the solution that's going to ultimately uh, be given to industry. So the more informed we are, uh, the more the more informed of a solution we can provide to energy. And there's many ways uh, to get in touch, and there's different levels of collaboration as well. There's, as I mentioned, spoke about uh, the formal collaborations, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the CRADA agreements. Uh, that's uh, a little bit more involved than than uh, what we would call something like the community of interest. At the very least, you'll be uh, informed uh, about all the projects we're doing and providing uh, provided the opportunity uh, to give input and and make your um, 
particular challenges, cybersecurity challenges known. Uh, we ho we typically host quarterly conference calls. Um, we have a lot of uh, email correspondence going out uh, quite consistently. So there's numerous ways to participate and engage with the NIST NCCOE directly. Don? Yeah, so, so I would like to in further encourage people. You know, Jim mentioned earlier that, that all of our problems come from a discussion with industry. We can only provide practical solutions to problems that we know about. So we encourage your collaboration with us to better understand the cybersecurity problems that you have. And the other side of that is that when we develop a solution, the only way that we know it's actually practical for utilities is by the utilities reviewing and working with us to understand our solution and tell us that it will meet their needs. So, so we need your help to both identify problems and ensure the solutions that we produce are usable by you. Andrew, how about something from you to uh, conclude this episode here? Sure. Let me, uh, you know, the, the Don and, and Jim didn't give it. So let me give a plug. If you're interested in looking at the results of these projects or even, you know, learning more about them or, or you know, getting notice of, of webinars, what you do is you go to the NCCOE website. So it's nccoe.nist.gov. And, uh, you know, you can sign up for their newsletter with the bright orange button on the upper right in uh, the desktop browser. I'm, I'm weak on how to do it on a cell phone. But there's a bright orange, uh, bright yellow orange, sign up for the newsletter. And if you want the results of the projects, go to the menu, Projects, Use Cases, Energy Sector, and you'll see the four projects there. Three of them have, uh, you know, links where you can, you can download these documents. And the fourth one is sort of a, a work in progress, securing the industrial internet of things for distributed energy. So that's how you reach it. With that, then, thanks to Jim McCarthy and Don Fotz for speaking with you, Andrew. And as always, thank you, Andrew, for speaking with me. Always a pleasure, Nate. We'll catch you next time. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everybody listening. <laughs>